The Levon Affair was an Israeli terrorist operation in Egypt known as Operation Susanna, in which Egyptian, American, and British-owned targets in Egypt were bombed in the summer of 1954. In the early 1950s, the U.S. was becoming friendlier with Egypt and was moving to influence the British to leave the Egyptian Suez Canal, which they had manned for almost 20 years. The apartheid state of Israel would not tolerate the British leaving and elements within Israel began planning a variety of terrorist attacks on British, Egyptian and American targets. These attacks would then be blamed on so-called Muslim extremists. This would incite the anger of the British and the Americans towards Egypt and Islam and sour the burgeoning relationship between Egypt, America and Britain. This plan for a series of false flag terrorist attacks was codenamed Operation Susanna. A group of Egyptian Jews was recruited to carry out the attacks. Jews in the diaspora that are recruited are known as Sayanin. The first bomb went off on July 2nd when a post office in Alexandria was firebombed. On the 11th of July, the Anglo-Egyptian Suez negotiations, which had been blocked for nine months, got underway again. Despite the British assuring Israel that stockpiled weapons would not be given to the Egyptians, on July 14th, the Jewish terrorists firebombed U.S. information agency libraries in Cairo and Alexandria. However, that same day, a phosphorus bomb exploded prematurely in one of the terrorists, Philip Natanson's pocket just as he was about to enter the British-owned Rio Cinema in Alexandria. His arrest and the subsequent confession led to the breakup of the whole ring. However, while the plot was being investigated, the Zionist Jewish terrorists started fires in two Cairo cinemas, in the central post office and the railway station. After the plot was uncovered, many tried to spin it as an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. As the trial of the Jewish terrorists became more and more public, Israel was forced to do damage control. They claimed that the Egyptians were tipped off and allowed the attacks to happen. They also singularly scapegoated the defense minister Pinhas Levon to prevent the exposure of the real group inside the apartheid state of Israel who planned Operation Susanna and several other false flag terrorist attacks. But this would not be the last time America's so-called ally and friend and recipient of over $150 billion in aid would attack her. As if a demolition team set off when you see the old demolition of these old buildings. It looks like one of those scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown up. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. It's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. June 8, 1967 was a clear, sunny day with unlimited visibility. It was such a nice day that as the USS Liberty floated in international waters 14 miles north of the Sinai Peninsula, sailors were sunbathing on the spy ship's deck. But all wasn't as tranquil as the sunny day would convey, for June 8th also marked the fourth day of the Six-Day War, which involved Israel, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Monitoring this situation was the USS Liberty, a World War II freighter that had been converted into a spy vessel by the NSA, the National Security Agency. In fact, the Liberty was the most sophisticated and identifiable intelligence ship in the world at the time, with dozens of large antennas, state-of-the-art electronic intercept equipment, moon-bound satellite dishes, massive aerials, plus a TRSS comm system that sent real-time messages to the Pentagon. The Liberty also flew a large 5 by 8 foot American flag, was freshly painted with large white numbers and letters on its bow and hull, and contained no offensive weaponry except for four 50 caliber machine guns for defensive purposes. These details are important to keep in mind because at 8 o'clock a.m., as the Liberty floated in international waters at less than 5 knots with a 5 by 8 foot American flag burling in the wind, 
A squadron of Israeli jets circled the ship at least a dozen times. These reconnaissance planes flew at such low levels, as close as 200 feet, that the sailors aboard the Liberty actually waved to the Israeli pilots. And, as we will show later in this documentary, those commanding these Israeli jets not only ID'd this ship as being of American origin, they also positively ID'd it as being the USS Liberty. Despite being fully aware of its status, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, three unmarked Israeli Mystere and Mirage III fighter jets pummeled the Liberty with rockets and cannon fire. These bombers initially went after the ship's antenna and electronics dishes, in the process filling the American flag full of holes. As sailors fled for cover, Liberty crewmen hoisted a new, even larger 7 by 13 foot flag into the air. But this new, even larger flag didn't stop the Israeli onslaught as they sprayed the Liberty with napalm, the highly incendiary substance burning the sailors' flesh. While this unprovoked act of war was taking place, radio operators aboard the Liberty tried to signal for help, but their SOS distress messages were not heard because the Israelis had deliberately jammed all five of the Liberty's emergency radio channels, a phenomenon that shows quite clearly that the interfering party was aware of their target beforehand and had previously zeroed in on it, for to jam a stranger's radio in such a rapid manner is virtually impossible. Unable to get help, the USS Liberty, with eight sailors already dead and 100 wounded, including Commander William McGonagall, was a sitting duck for the Israelis who at 2.24 p.m. sent in three torpedo boats loaded with thousands of pounds of explosives. With their target already in flames, the Israelis bombed the Liberty with shells, quickly killing 25 more men. As firefighters and medical personnel tried to put out fires and save their ship and crew, they were repeatedly machine gunned by Israeli aircraft. By 3.15 p.m., after it was apparent that the Israelis didn't want to leave a single man alive, the crew abandoned ship. But as the surviving crewmen fled for their lives, Israeli warships at close range sprayed those rafts aboard the ship with gunfire, along with those carrying the wounded that had already been lowered into the water. It was a sickening display of brutality and savage inhumanity, a total lack of regard for human life. The Israelis wanted no survivors. When word eventually reached the White House, President Lyndon Baines Johnson assumed that it was the Egyptians attacking our ship, so he immediately dispatched air support, which would have reached the Liberty in 40 minutes. But then, when LBJ discovered that it was in fact the Israelis who were attacking our vessel, he immediately called off the rescue. In other words, Phantom jets, already en route from the Sixth Fleet, were ordered to turn around and return to their point of origin. Try to let the seriousness of this situation sink in for a moment. Navy fighters launched from the aircraft carriers USS Saratoga and USS America were recalled by the White House. But the blame doesn't stop there. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara and National Security Advisor Walter Rostow at first ordered instantaneous retaliation, but upon discovering that the attack originated from Israel's Haifa base, McNamara called off the exercise. In fact, it was reported later that Robert McNamara was so irate when discovering that Liberty Radio men contacted the USS America that he barked, tell the Sixth Fleet to get those aircraft back immediately. Due to this traitorous behavior, the USS Liberty had to wait 16 hours after the attack stopped before they were rescued by our military forces. It is the only instance in American naval history that a rescue mission was aborted while an American ship was under attack. In all, the Israeli attack on America's USS Liberty, a ship that sat almost motionless in the water with no offensive weaponry while sailors sunbathed on its deck, lasted for two full hours, equaling the length of Japan's infamous attack on Pearl Harbor. 821 holes were found in the ship, resulting from aircraft rockets, cannon fire, and torpedo blasts, while over 3,000 holes from Israel's machine gun fire were also counted. Far more tragically, the Israelis killed 34 Americans that fateful day, wounded 171 more, and instigated the worst U.S. naval losses since World War II. And even though U.S. Secretary of State Dean Rusk and Joint Chiefs of Staff Admiral Thomas Moore called this attack deliberate, to this day not one guilty party in Israel or the U.S. has been brought to justice. 
All the for you. thoughts that always come back to us time and time again is how this thing is still being covered up after 40 years. And we know without doubt from those circumstances that it was a deliberate attack. Uh, anyone who looks carefully at the details knows that it was deliberate, and that includes such people as Dean Rusk, as Secretary of State, and all of the heads of all of the intelligence organizations. Will the record show that the statements of Mr. Ennis are correct? Here are a few quotes for your consideration. On the strength of intercept transcripts of pilots' conversations during the attack, the question of the attack's deliberateness just wasn't a disputed issue within the agency. Lieutenant General William E. Odom, former director, National Security Agency, interview with David Walsh on March 3rd, 2003, reported in Naval Institute Proceedings, June 2003. Inman said he flatly rejected the crystal thesis that the attack was an accident. Quote, it is just exceedingly difficult to believe that the USS Liberty was not correctly identified. Based on talks with NSA seniors at the time, having direct knowledge of intercepted communications, no NSA official could be found who dissented from the deliberate conclusion. Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, United States Navy, Director, National Security Agency, 1977 to 1981, reported in Proceedings, June 2003. Quote, I can tell you for an absolute certainty from intercepted communications that they knew they were attacking an American ship, unquote. Oliver Kirby, former Deputy Director for Operations and Production, National Security Agency. Kirby participated in the NSA's investigation of the attack and reviewed translations of intercepted communications between pilots and their headquarters, which he reports show conclusively that they knew their target was an American ship. Kirby is considered the godfather of the USS Liberty and USS Pueblo intercept programs. From telephone interviews with James Ennis and David Walsh, for Friendless Fire, Proceedings, June 2003. In a handwritten note dated 26th, August 1967 by NSA Deputy Director Louis W. Tordella reacting to the Israeli court decision exonerating Israelis of all the blame for the Liberty attack, it is stated, quote, a nice whitewash for a group of ignorant, stupid, and inept f***ers, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no secret is revealed. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. Confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent.
By now it seems that we've all been told the many and widely varying theories of the events of September 11, 2001. The official story of 9-11 presents that a group of extremist Muslim terrorists, known as Al-Qaeda, planned and orchestrated the attacks. Yet others have told us that among the responsible are U.S. President George Bush Jr., U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney, and a variety of other criminal elements in the United States government. These two conceptions are central to the 9-11 story, while there is some argument on the latter side as to how the events took place. Some theories as to the science of the attacks have presented that the impact of two planes and a fire fueled by jet fuel, which is mostly kerosene, brought down three concrete and reinforced steel buildings. Those structures would be World Trade Center Building 1, Building 2, and World Trade Center Building 7. Others posit that controlled demolitions were planted in the towers. It is not in the scope of this video to prove nor dispute the science of how the towers came down that fateful day. However, it is our belief that among such theories, the case showing demolitions has been the most sound. Our intentions in this chapter are to specifically show you who was responsible for this mass murder of Americans. We will examine a group of people who are a corrosive mafia with a racial and religious cohesion. It will become clear how fraudulent theories concerning 9-11 have been fomented and end up benefiting this group, and how the foundational crime of September 11th has been the catalyst for multiple and far-reaching crimes by this well-organized supremacist mafia. It's time we achieve the long-awaited complete truth of what happened on 9-11, because the future of humanity depends upon it. There are two documents which are central to understanding the intricate planning for the events of September 11th. The first is titled, A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm, and shortened to the ACB doc. The ACB was created in Israel at the IASPS. The core of the document illustrated a systematic plan to conquer the Middle East by engineering a flawless image of Israel and promoting the state as a great ally of the United States. The ACB doc was essentially duplicated in the so-called Republican think tank called the Project for a New American Century, also referred to as PNAC. The same Jewish authors of the ACB doc wrote PNAC's paper called Rebuilding America's Defenses, in which they called for a catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. PNAC is at first called a Republican think tank, but finds itself later termed a neocon or neoconservative group. The reality is that neocon is just another layer of the onion that covers up the existence of the Jewish criminal network. So long as they keep calling the network anything other than specifically a Jewish criminal network, then their greatest strength, which is their racial cohesion, goes undetected. PNAC, the project for a new American century, was not a neocon or even a Zionist think tank, but a Jewish criminal think tank. This crime network existed long before Zionism was ever codified. Therefore, it is absolutely appropriate and necessary for us to refer to it as the Jewish criminal network, as opposed to merely using the term Zionism, although that term is sometimes employed. PNAC consists of several non-Jewish criminal personalities, but be certain that its primary function is to serve the will of the Jewish Mafia and the terrorist state of Israel. Some of the Jewish members of the Project for a New American Century are Elliot Abrams, John Bolton, Paula Dobriansky, Robert Kagan, William Crystal, Richard Pearl, Peter Rodman, William Schneider Jr., Paul Wolfowitz. Preparation for the attacks of September 11, 2001 did not just come in the form of how it would be engineered, but how the resulting energy from the socio-political, economic, and emotional upheaval could be directed and utilized to the benefit of the criminal cabal. American policy would become neocon policy, yet the term neocon, once again, is misleading, as what we are really talking about are the goals of a Jewish power elite 
and the hundreds of thousands of everyday Jews who serve in their massive Sionim network. The power structure that would funnel the erupting force of 9-11 can be seen in the three distinct but interlocking categories. The first is the defense arm, with members Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Douglas Fife, Elliot Abrams, and David Wormser. This group was tasked with orchestrating a policy of preemptive action toward the Middle East in order so it may be reformed or remade in their vision. They further sought to substantially increase foreign aid to Israel, encourage joint weapons development, open up doors for new homeland security business opportunities, and legitimize the genocidal takeover of Palestine. The means by which they would achieve these objectives would be through inserting themselves and their cohorts in think tanks, defense policy boards, defense department contractors, talk shows, and investment banks. The second arm of the cabal was to be the pro-Israel press, formed of David Brooks, Lawrence Kaplan, William Crystal, and Norman Potteritz, among other numerous personalities. Their objectives were to create the idea of the danger of Islam, render all Arab governments illegitimate in the public mind, make illegitimate any land for peace initiatives, and secure the idea that our primary American objective must be to defend Israel. This was achieved through the American Enterprise Institute, Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, or JINSA, Heritage Foundation Reports, as well as The Weekly Standard, The New Republic, Commentary Magazine, and through the American Jewish Committee. The final tentacle of the cabal is the group of columnists who directly swayed public opinion. Four major personalities, among others, are Robert Kagan, Charles Krauthammer, Max Boot and William Sapphire. They sought to paint Palestinian militants as terrorists, create a linkage between 9-11 and all Arab governments, make anyone critical of Israel and the Jewish criminal mafia out to be an anti-Semite, and make Israelis heroes in the minds of Americans. The movie You Don't Mess With the Zohan, starring Jewish actor Adam Sandler, serves these final objectives expertly by slipping under the radar as mere entertainment. He is the greatest Israeli soldier the world has ever known. His training is lethal, and his skills are legendary. In October 2000, approximately 11 months prior to September 11, 2001, a former Israeli Defense Force or IDF member and veteran of the Yom Kippur War 1973 was collecting English ivy cuttings at the Gomel Chesed Cemetery located at McKellen and 245 Mount Olive Avenue in Newark, New Jersey. The Gamel Chesed Cemetery is a Jewish cemetery. While he was scouting the cemetery for ivy cuttings, he overheard what he believed to be a conversation spoken in Hebrew, which drew his attention. As he watched and listened, a third man arrived to the meeting in a Lincoln town car. What the observer of these happenings heard, after normal niceties were exchanged between the three men, alarmed him. The man who arrived in the town car said, the Americans will learn what it is to live with terrorists after the planes hit the twins in September. One of the men that had been leaning against the retaining wall expressed concerns regarding whether the upcoming presidential election, November 2000, between Bush and Cheney and Gore and Lieberman, could impact the plans. The man that arrived in the town car pacified the doubts by saying, Don't worry, we have people in high places, and no matter who gets elected, they will take care of everything. According to his account, on 9th February 2001, approximately eight months prior to the airplanes being flown into the twins, he sent an email to then Attorney General Ascroft, informing the Attorney General that he had important terrorism-related information. The U.S. Department of Justice did not directly respond to the source. It forwarded the email to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
Shortly thereafter, on 28th March 2001, the source received a letter from Arthur Radford Baker, FBI, informing him that if he had information to share, he should contact the FBI Newark Division. The source contacted the FBI Newark Division and was told that two agents would be in contact with him, but no FBI agents came at that time. The source continued to call the FBI Newark Division in an attempt to pass his information on to the agency. He wanted to do this in person to ensure that it wasn't carelessly discarded or dismissed. He also sought a guarantee of protection by the FBI. As September 2001 drew closer, he grew more impatient. He began to act with a sense of urgency because in his words, quote, time was running out. As he was getting nowhere with the FBI Newark Division, the source decided to write a letter to Arthur Bradford Baker on 21st May 2001, the person that sent the letter advising him that he should contact the FBI Newark Division. In this letter, the source reiterated that he had important information to share with the government, but would need a guarantee of protection by the FBI before he could disclose all that he knew. On the day that the source received a response letter from Arthur Radford Baker, 26th June 2001, now less than three months prior to the 9-11 attacks, two FBI agents finally paid a visit. They were Agent Robin Gritz and Agent Andrew Stengel. The agents were shown the second letter received that day from Arthur Radford Baker by the source. The letter informed the source that the FBI would not be able to do anything on his behalf. Here's some intelligence concerning the NSA. Yet another report focuses on the Israeli-based private communications company Amdocs, where a number of 60 detained suspects worked. Most directory assistance calls and virtually all call records and billing in the U.S. are done for the telephone companies by Amdocs LTD, which has contracts with the 25 largest phone companies in the U.S. and more worldwide. It is virtually impossible to make a call on a landline without generating an Amdocs record. Through Amdocs, it would be possible to keep ahead of investigators by knowing who they are calling. In 1999, the Maryland headquartered National Security Agency issued a top secret report warning that records of calls in the United States were ending up in foreign hands, Israel in particular. Investigators do not believe calls are being bugged, but the data about who is calling whom and when is very valuable in itself. On 10th September 2001, just 24 hours before the World Trade Center attack, the Washington Times ran an article quoting intelligence sources who described Israel's Mossad as, quote, a wild card, ruthless and cunning and has the capability to target U.S. forces and make it look like a Palestinian Arab act, unquote. Moreover, they said it was generally known in the intelligence community that the Mossad had penetrated every Muslim organization and would have a little problem in finding any number of fanatics to carry out a suicide mission in the belief that they were serving Allah. As reported by Christopher Boleyn on 12th of September 2001, the Internet edition of the Jerusalem Post announced that, quote, the Israeli Foreign Ministry has collected the names of 4,000 Israelis believed to have been in the areas of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon at the time of the attack, unquote. Yet only one Israeli was killed at the World Trade Center and two were reportedly killed on the supposedly hijacked aircraft. Although a total of three Israeli lives were reportedly lost on 9-11, speechwriters for President George W. Bush grossly inflated the number of Israeli dead to 130 in the President's address to the Joint Session of Congress on 20th September 2001. The fact that only one Israeli died at the World Trade Center while 4,000 Israelis were thought to have been at the scene of the attacks on 9-11 naturally led to a widespread rumor blamed on Arabic sources that Israelis had been forewarned to stay away that day. Quote, whether this story was the origin of the rumor, Brett Stevens, the Post's editor-in-chief, wrote in 2003, I cannot say. What I can say is that there was no mistake in our report.
As the world watched in disbelief and asked, how could this be possible, five Israelis, later discovered to be Mossad operatives, were seen dancing with joy. Fox News duplicated a report given by the New York Times. Little space was given to this information, but they did in fact state that, quote, a group of five men had set up video cameras aimed at the Twin Towers prior to the attack on Tuesday and were seen congratulating one another afterwards, unquote. Police received several calls from angry New Jersey residents claiming Middle Eastern men, quote unquote, with a white van were videotaping the disaster with shouts of joy and mockery. They were seen by New Jersey residents on September 11th making fun of the World Trade Center ruins and going to extreme lengths to photograph themselves in front of the wreckage. Witnesses saw them jumping for joy in Liberty State Park after the initial impact. Later on, other witnesses saw them celebrating on a roof in Weehawken. I grabbed my binoculars and I could see the towers from my window. And this is where, I, you know, I'm looking. And all of a sudden, down there, I see this van park. And I see three guys on top of the van. And I could see that they were, like, happy. You know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me. You know, they didn't look shocked. I thought it was very strange. We had received an all points bulletin, and uh, I just happened to see the van and, you know, hollered over to my lieutenant. You know, I think that could be the van. We checked it out, and it was. You know, we were all on edge, obviously, so I really wasn't looking to make friends with these people, and neither were the officers that I were with. Once we started talking to them, you know, they were pretty much like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're not against you, we're with you. And still other witnesses later saw them celebrating with high fives in a Jersey City parking lot. Another witness stated, quote, It looked like they were hooked in with this. It looked like they knew what was going to happen when they were at Liberty State Park. One anonymous phone call to authorities actually led them to close down all of New York's bridges and tunnels. The mystery caller told the 911 dispatcher that a group of Palestinians were mixing a bomb inside of a white van headed for the Holland Tunnel. Here's the transcript from NBC News. Jersey City Police? Yes. We have a white van, two or three guys in there. They look like Palestinians and going around a building. There's a minivan heading toward the Holland Tunnel. I see the guy by Newark Airport mixing some junk and he has those chic uniform. He has what? He's dressed like an Arab. The caller seems honest enough, but consider this. Why would the anonymous caller specifically say that these Arabs were Palestinians? How would he know that? Furthermore, Palestinians usually dress in Western-style clothes, not chic uniform. Based on that phone call, police then issued a be-on-the-lookout alert for a white minivan heading for the city's bridges and tunnels from New Jersey. The description was given as this. White, 2000 Chevrolet van with urban moving system sign on back seen at Liberty State Park, Jersey City, New Jersey, at the time of first impact of jetliner into World Trade Center. Three individuals with van were seen celebrating after initial impact and subsequent explosion. FBI Newark Field Office requests that if the van is located, hold for prints and detain individuals. When a van fitting the exact description was stopped just before crossing into New York, the suspicious Middle Easterners were apprehended. Imagine the surprise of the police officers when these terror suspects turned out to be Israelis. According to ABC's 2020, when the van belonging to the cheering Israelis was stopped by the police, the driver of the van, Savan Kurtzberg, told the officers, We are Israelis. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are your problem. Why did he feel that the Palestinians were a problem for the NYPD? The police and FBI field agents became very suspicious when they found maps of the city with certain places highlighted. Box cutters, the same items that the hijackers supposedly used, $4,700 cash stuffed in a sock, and foreign passports. Police also told the Bergen Record that bomb sniffing dogs were brought to the van and that they reacted as if they had smelled explosives. The FBI seized and developed their photos, one of which shows Savon Kurtzberg flicking a cigarette lighter in front of the smoldering ruins in an apparently celebratory gesture. The Jerusalem Post later reported that a white van with a bomb was stopped as it approached the George Washington Bridge, but the ethnicity of the suspects was not revealed. Here's what the Jerusalem Post reported on 12th September 2001. 
Quote, American Security Services overnight stopped a car bomb on the George Washington Bridge. The van, packed with explosives, was stopped on an approach ramp to the bridge. Authorities suspect the terrorists intended to blow up the main crossing between New Jersey and New York. Army Radio reported, unquote. Two suspects are in FBI custody after a truckload of explosives was discovered around the George Washington Bridge. That bridge... Uh, links uh, New York to New Jersey over the Hudson River. Whether the discovery of those explosives had anything to do with other events today is unclear, but the FBI has two suspects in hand, said the truck uh, load of explosives, and enough explosives were in the truck to do great damage to the George Washington Bridge. The Jewish Weekly called The Forward reported that the FBI finally concluded that at least two of the detained Israelis were agents working for the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, and that Urban Moving Systems, the ostensible employer of the five Israelis, was a front operation. This was confirmed by two former CIA officers, and they noted that movers' vans are a common intelligence cover. The Israelis were held in custody for 71 days before being quietly released. Quote, there was no question but that the order to close down the investigation came from the White House. It was immediately assumed at CIA headquarters that this basically was going to be a cover-up so that the Israelis would not be implicated in any way in 9-11, unquote. Several of the detainees discussed their experience in America on an Israeli talk show after their return home. <laughs> And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S., who may have known things they didn't tell us before September 11th. Fox News correspondent Carl Cameron has details in the first of a four-part series. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins, but when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, Evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Fox News has learned that one group of Israelis, spotted in North Carolina recently, is suspected of keeping an apartment in California to spy on a group of Arabs who the United States is also investigating for links to terrorism. Numerous classified documents obtained by Fox News indicate that even prior to September 11th, as many as 140 other Israelis had been detained or arrested in a secretive and sprawling investigation into suspected espionage by Israelis in the United States. Investigators from numerous government agencies are part of a working group that's been compiling evidence since the mid-90s. These documents detail hundreds of incidents in cities and towns across the country that investigators say, quote, may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. The first part of the investigation focuses on Israelis who say they are art students from the University of Jerusalem and Bezalel Academy. They repeatedly made contact with U.S. government personnel, the report says, by saying they wanted to sell cheap art or handiwork. Documents say they, quote, targeted and penetrated military bases, the DEA, FBI, and dozens of other government facilities, and even secret offices and unlisted private homes of law enforcement and intelligence personnel. The majority of those questioned, quote, stated they served in military intelligence, electronic surveillance intercept, and or explosive ordnance units. Explosive ordnance units. Explosive ordnance units. 
Another part of the investigation has resulted in the detention and arrests of dozens of Israelis at American mall kiosks, where they've been selling toys called Puzzle Car and Zoom Copter. Investigators suspect a front. Shortly after the New York Times and Washington Post reported the Israeli detentions last month, the carts began vanishing. ZoomCopter's webpage says, We are aware of the situation caused by thousands of mall carts being closed at the last minute. This in no way reflects the quality of the toy or its saleability. The problem lies in the operator's business policies. Why would Israelis spy in and on the U.S.? A general accounting office investigation referred to Israel as Country A and said, quote, According to a U.S. intelligence agency, the government of Country A conducts the most aggressive espionage operation against the U.S. of any U.S. ally. A defense intelligence report said Israel has a voracious appetite for information and, quote, the Israelis are motivated by strong survival instincts which dictate every facet of their political and economic policies. It aggressively collects military and industrial technology, and the U.S. is a high-priority target. The document concludes, quote, Israel possesses the resources and technical capability to achieve its collection objectives. Evidence that Israelis had been forewarned several hours before the attack surfaced at an Israeli instant messaging service known as Autogo. This story, clear evidence of Israeli prior knowledge, was reported only briefly in the U.S. media and quickly forgotten. At least two Israeli-based employees of Autogo received warnings of an imminent attack in New York City more than two hours before the first plane hit the World Trade Center. Autogo had its U.S. headquarters two blocks from the World Trade Center. The Autogo employees, however, did not pass the warning on to the authorities in New York City, a move that could have saved thousands of lives. Autogo has a feature called People Finder that allows users to seek out and contact others based on certain demographics, such as Israeli nationality. Two weeks after 9-11, Alex Diamandis, Autogo's vice president, reportedly said, quote, It was possible that the attack warning was broadcast to other Autogo members, but the company has not received reports of other recipients of the message, unquote. The Internet address of the sender was given to the FBI, and two months later it was reported that the FBI was still investigating the matter. There have been no media reports since. Autogo, like many Israeli software companies, is based and has its research and development, or R&D, center in Herzliya, Israel, a small town north of Tel Aviv, which happens to be where Mossad's headquarters are located. Shortly after 9-11, Autogo was taken over by Converse Technology, another Israeli company. Within a year, five executives from Converse were reported to have profited by more than $267 million from insider trading. Through Israeli venture capital, investment funds, Mossad spawns and sponsors scores of software companies currently doing business in the United States. These Israeli-based companies are sponsored by Mossad funding sources such as Cedar Fund, Stage One Ventures, Veritas Venture Partners, and others. As one might expect, the portfolios of these Mossad-linked funding companies contain only Israeli-based companies, such as Autogo. The Israeli company Autogo provided two hours advance warning to people on a buddy list. In addition to the Autogo early warning, it is reported that the Tokyo branch of Goldman Sachs also released a memo on 10th September 2001 that warned its employees to steer clear of any American government. Even if one believes that 19 hijackers, not from Iraq, Iran, or Afghanistan, but Saudi Arabia, were responsible for the events of September 11th, it would seem wise for us to at least hold the airport security responsible for letting those men board the planes. The airport security was handled by an Israeli company called ICTS. Ezra Harrell, a Jew, is the owner. The company is registered in the Netherlands and was employed at Charles de Gaulle Airport to screen passengers boarding U.S. planes. 
Most of its personnel are ex-Shin Bet officers. The company covers security at Boston's Logan Airport, where the American Airlines plane came down after flight attendants and passengers overpowered Richard Reed. You might recall Reed as the man with the shoe bomb. ICTS knew he was dangerous, but allowed him to board a flight from Tel Aviv to Paris. Well, did ICTS know that he was dangerous? Or is their security just that shoddy? ICTS's own website states that it sells services to every airport from which the hijacked planes on 9-11 operated, including security services, and this is sometimes done through wholly owned subsidiaries like Huntley USA Corporation. It has been suggested that the incredible feat of hijacking four aircraft without a single arrest at the gate would require the resources of a nation state. This is even more true with the revelation that at least one gun had managed to board a hijacked plane. One company had automatic inside access to all of the airports from which hijacked planes departed on 9-11 and to the airports used by Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, an Israeli company, one that Mossad agents could easily find employment with without the management knowing who they were or what their purpose really was. As an additional note to ICTS's complicity, hours before the House version of the first so-called Patriot Act went to a vote, technical corrections, quote-unquote, were inserted into the body of the legislation whereby foreign security companies, such as ICTS International, would be immune from lawsuits related to the events of 9-11. Talk about not being available for deposition. This Patriot Act legislation sleight of hand occurred before the inception of the 9-11 Commission when fearless leader George W. Bush was still resisting the very idea of an investigation into 9-11. Hence, in the face of an institutional cover-up, citizens were denied the possibility of a discovery process which is normally afforded to litigants. Without such discovery process, ICTS International would never be compelled by a court of law to give testimony and show evidence related to the missing airport video surveillance tapes of 9-11 or any other aspect of security measures in place on 9-11. A few quotes to digest. Evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. But investigators within the DEA, INS, and FBI have all told Fox News that to pursue or even suggest Israeli spying through Converse is considered career suicide. While an Israeli real estate magnate from Australia insured his 99-year lease on the retail space of the World Trade Center against terrorism, one of Israel's biggest companies pulled out of the North Tower just days before September 11th. Zim American Israeli Shipping Company, Incorporated broke the lease when it vacated the rented offices on the 16th and 17th floors of the North Tower of the World Trade Center shortly before the September 11th disaster. According to intelligence, Zim's World Trade Center office space had been leased until the end of the year and the company lost $50,000 when it suddenly pulled out in the beginning of September. The parent company, Zim Israel Navigation Company, is nearly half owned by the state of Israel. The other half held by Israel Corp. Zim is one of the world's largest container shipping companies operating an international network of shipping lines. The Israeli company's move out of the World Trade Center one week before the attacks saw the forfeiture of $50,000 in broken lease fees. Zim has since moved part of its operations to Houston, Texas. FBI agent Mike Dick aggressively investigated this Israeli ring before and after 9-11. Like another investigator by the name of O'Neill, Mike soon found himself removed from his duties on the orders of the then head of the Justice Department's criminal division, Michael Chertoff a dual citizen of Israel. Dick was very suspicious when Israeli movers quickly moved Zim American Israeli Shipping Company out of its 10,000 square feet of office space on the 17th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center and subsequent forfeiture of a $50,000 security deposit when they vacated one week prior to 9-11. According to a CIA non-official cover or NOC source or NOC source who worked with Dick, Israeli movers moved explosives into the 17th 
second floor office space after Zim moved out. After 9-11, Dick, as well as the CIA not, were harassed by their superiors on orders from above. Those orders came from the Jew Michael Chertoff. Dick was first relieved of his primary counter-espionage duties, eventually sent to Pakistan to investigate the kidnapping of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Hurl, and eventually buried in a desk job at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. According to the CIA source, Hurl was murdered because he was getting too close to the money trail that financed 9-11. The CIA source said, quote, the same group that beheaded Pearl in Pakistan did the beheadings in Iraq, unquote. The source added that the beheadings were not Al-Qaeda. The CIA source, who emphasized his past Republican credentials, emphasized that Al-Qaeda was merely a list of arms dealers, mercenaries, drug dealers, financiers, and terrorists used by the CIA and Saudis during the Afghan Mujahideen War against the Soviets. The source also iterated that all the 9-11 hijackers had fake IDs during a joint CIA-FBI operation against lead hijacker Mohammed Atta in Fort Lee, New Jersey in 2000, the CIA and FBI team leaders complained to their superiors that their operation was being photographed by Israeli agents, thus compromising the operation. The CIA source affirmed that the Israelis in New Jersey were providing cover for the future hijacker teams. O'Neill had discovered that some of his Al-Qaeda targets, quote-unquote, were involved in some very un-Islamic fundamentalist activities including drug smuggling, teenage prostitution, and blood diamond dealing. Los Angeles, 1997. A major local, state, and federal drug investigation sours. The suspects? Israeli organized crime, with operations in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Canada, Israel, and Egypt. The allegations? cocaine and ecstasy trafficking, and sophisticated white-collar credit card and computer fraud. The financial trail led O'Neill to a network of bank accounts in London, Dubai, the Isle of Man, Guernsey, and Jersey. The network investigated coincided exactly with the activities being carried out by the Russian-Israeli Mafia and its links to diamond, drug, and weapons dealers that was especially active in New York and Florida. The future 9-11 hijackers and their Israeli shadows had more than living in the same neighborhoods and frequenting the same bars, video rental stores, and rental mailboxes. Who shipped out the steel rubble of the World Trade Center towers? That would be none other than Metals Management, headed by Jew Alan D. Ratner. The most critical evidence to determine what really caused the towers to collapse was quickly destroyed after being sold to Asian smelters. Ratner, of Metals Management, now merged with The Sims Group and the New York-based Hugo New Snitzer East, profited from this criminal destruction of evidence. Ratner sold the World Trade Center steel to Chinese companies, reportedly selling more than 50,000 tons of steel to a Shanghai steel company for $120 per ton. Ratner had paid about $70 per ton for this crime scene evidence. Another central element of understanding how the attacks could be pulled off by the Jewish power elite would be a careful review of the number of dual Israeli citizens serving in the various branches of our government. The primary question here is, how could a person be a citizen of two countries at the same time? It's abundantly clear that such a person would have their loyalty split between the country of residence and the other country they hold citizenship in. Therefore, whose interests would they be working for, the United States or Israel? As reported in a document titled The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, Harvard professor Stephen Walt and University of Chicago professor John Mersheimer focused attention on the strong Israeli lobby which has a powerful influence over American foreign policies. They detail the influence the lobby has exerted, forming a series of international policies which can be viewed as in direct opposition to the interests and security of the American people. These acts and policies are more often than not carried out by U.S. government appointees who hold powerful positions and who are dual American Israeli citizens. Since the policies they support are often exclusively beneficial to Israel, often to the detriment of America, it has been argued that their loyalties are misdirected. A few classic examples can be cited here. 
Jonathan J. Pollard, was an American Israeli citizen who worked for the U.S. government. He is well known because he stole more secrets from the U.S. than has any other spy in American history. During his interrogation, Pollard said he felt compelled to put the interests of my state ahead of his own. Although as a U.S. Navy counterintelligence specialist, he had a top secret security clearance. By my state, he meant the state of Israel. Literally tens of thousands Thousands of Americans holding U.S. passports admit they feel a primary allegiance to the state of Israel. In many instances, these Americans vote in Israeli elections, wear Israeli uniforms, and fight in Israeli wars. Many are actively engaged both in the confiscation of Palestinian lands and in the Israeli political system. Three examples follow. Rabbi Meir Kahan founded the militant Jewish Defense League in the U.S. in the 1960s then immigrated to Israel where he was elected to the Neset until he was shot and killed at one of the US fundraising rallies in 1990. The Brooklyn-born rabbi shuttled between Tel Aviv and New York where he recruited militant American Jews for his activities in Israel against Palestinians. He claimed to be a dual citizen of America and Israel. Another Jew, James Mahone from Alexandria, Virginia, reportedly was on a secret mission to kill PLO chairman Yasser Arafat when he was shot in 1980 by an unknown assailant. When he was shot, Mahone held an American M16 in his hand and a U.S. passport in his pocket. Alan Harry Goodman, an American Jew who left his home in Baltimore, Maryland, flew to Israel and served in the Israeli army. Then, on 11th April 1982, armed with an Uzi submachine gun, he walked alone to Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem's most holy Islamic shrine, where he opened fire, killing two Palestinians and wounding others. Both the U.S. and Israeli government played down the incident, as did the Jewish-controlled media. Most recently, U.S. Navy Petty Officer Ariel J. Weinman, while serving at or near Baran, Mexico, and Austria, quote, with intent or reason to believe it would be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of a foreign nation, Israel, attempted to communicate, deliver, or transmit classified, confidential, and secret information relating to the national defense to a representative officer, agent, or employee of a foreign government, unquote. Weinman was apprehended on 26 March after being listed as a, quote, deserter by his command, unquote, according to the U.S. Navy. The information he gathered was supplied to Israel. On 22nd, April 2008, Ben Ami Kaddish, a Connecticut-born U.S. dual citizen who worked in New Jersey, was arrested and charged with giving top-secret nuclear information and details about the U.S. Patriot missile to an Israeli agent, the same agent involved with the J. Pollard case. The espionage charges reportedly stem from acts committed in the 1980s. These activities, like the ones with convicted spy Pollard, were immediately denied by Israel. Pollard pleaded guilty in 1986. It is further reported that Israeli officials instructed Kaddish to lie to U.S. investigators. Kaddish was scheduled to be arraigned on Tuesday afternoon, 22nd April 2008, at U.S. District Court in Manhattan, authorities said. The examples of Kahan, Mahone, Goodman, and Weinman raise the question of when a U.S. citizen ceases to be, or should cease to be, a U.S. citizen. U.S. law at one time clearly stated that an American citizen owed first allegiance to the United States. A U.S. citizen should not fight in a foreign army or hold high office in a foreign country without risking expatriation. What happened? It was the 1940 Nationality Act. In Section 401E of the 1940 Nationality Act, provides that a U.S. citizen, whether by birth or naturalization, quote, shall lose his U.S. nationality by voting in a political election in a foreign state, unquote. This law was tested many times. In 1958, for instance, an American citizen named Perez voted in a Mexican election. The case went to the Supreme Court, 
where the majority opinion held that Perez must lose his American nationality. The court said Congress could provide for expatriation as a reasonable way of preventing embarrassment to the United States in its foreign relations. But then something very odd happened. In 1967, an American Jew, Beis Ephraim, received an exemption that set a precedent exclusively for American Jews. Ephraim, born in Poland in 1895, immigrated to America in 1912 and became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1926. In 1950, aged 55, he immigrated to Israel and became an Israeli citizen. In 1951, Ephraim voted in an Israeli Neset election and in five political elections that followed. So, by all standards, he lost his American citizenship, right? Wrong. After living in Israel for a decade, Ephraim wished to return to New York. In 1960, he asked the U.S. consulate in Haffa for an American passport. The Department of State refused the application, invoking Section 401E of the Nationality Act, the same ruling that had stripped the American citizen named Perez of his U.S. citizenship. Attorneys acting for Ephraim took his case to a Washington, D.C. district court, which upheld the law. Then, his attorneys appealed to the Court of Appeals. This court also upheld the law. The attorneys for Ephraim then moved the case on to the Supreme Court. Here, with Supreme Court Justice Abby Fortas, Lyndon Johnson's former attorney, and one of the most powerful Jews casting the swing vote, the court voted 5-4 to four in favor of Ephraim. The court held that the U.S. government had no right to rob Ephraim of his American citizenship. The court, reversing its previous judgment as regards the Mexican-American, ruled that Ephraim had not shown intent to lose his citizenship by voting in Israeli elections. While Washington claims it has a good neighbor policy with Mexico, the U.S. does not permit Mexicans to hold dual nationality. The U.S. makes them become either U.S. or Mexican. You can't be both. But the U.S., in its special relationship with Israel, has become very sympathetic to allowing Israeli Americans to retain two nationalities and allowing U.S. citizens not only to hold public office in Israel, but to hold U.S. government positions as well. No other country holds this special exception to our laws of citizenship. So, you may ask, are there any other dual Israel-American citizens who hold U.S. government positions that could compromise American security? The answer is yes. Consider the following list. Michael McKay, recently appointed as U.S. Attorney General. McKay also was the judge in the litigation between developer Larry Silverstein and several insurance companies arising from the destruction of the World Trade Center on 9-11-2001. Michael Chertoff former Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Justice Department, now Head of Homeland Security. Richard Pearl, one of Bush's foreign policy advisors, he is the Chairman of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board, a very likely Israeli government agent. Pearl was expelled from Senator Henry Jackson's office in the 1970s after the National Security Agency, or NSA, caught him passing highly classified national security documents to the Israeli embassy. He later worked for the Israeli weapons firm Soltam. Pearl came from a pro-Israel think tank, the AEI. Pearl is one of the leading pro-Israeli fanatics leading this Iraq warmongering within the administration and now in the media. Paul Wolfowitz, former Deputy Defense Secretary and member of Pearl's Defense Policy Board in the Pentagon. Wolfowitz is a close associate of Pearl and reportedly has close ties to the Israeli military. His sister lives in Israel. Wolfowitz came from the Jewish think tank Jensa. Wolfowitz was was the number two leader within the administration behind this Iraq warmongering. He later was appointed head of the World Bank, but resigned under pressure from World Bank members over a scandal involving his misuse of power. Lawrence or Larry Franklin, the former Defense Intelligence Agency analyst with expertise in Iranian policy issues, who worked in the office of Undersecretary of Defense for Policy Douglas Fife and reported directly to Fife's deputy, William Lutie was sentenced 20th January 2006 to, quote, more than 12 years in prison for giving classified information to an Israeli diplomat, unquote. And members of the pro-Israel lobbying group 
American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC. Franklin will, quote, remain free while the government continues with the wider case, unquote. And his, quote, prison time could be sharply reduced in return for his help in prosecuting, unquote, former APAC members Stephen J. Rosen and Keith Wiseman. As an update to this, the trial with these APAC spies has been postponed indefinitely. How could the trial be postponed indefinitely? Kevin DeGregory was the head prosecuting attorney, but weeks prior to the trial, he had retired from his position as prosecutor to go work for a Jewish law firm. Douglas Fife, Undersecretary of Defense and Policy Advisor at the Pentagon. He is a close associate of Pearl and served as his special counsel. Like Pearl and the others, Fife is a pro-Israel extremist who has advocated anti-Arab policies in the past. He is closely associated with the extremist group the Zionist Organization of America, which even attacks Jews that don't agree with its extremist views. Fife frequently speaks at ZOA conferences. Fife runs a small law firm, Fife and Zell, which only has one international office in Israel. The majority of their legal work is representing Israeli interests. His firm's own website stated prior to his appointment that Fife, quote, represents Israeli armaments manufacturer, unquote. Fife basically represents the Israeli war machine. Fife also came from the Jewish think tank Jensa. Fife, like Pearl and Wolfowitz, are campaigning hard for the continuation of the Israeli proxy wars against Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Fife was investigated by the FBI under suspicion of leaking classified information to Israel, being that he was Larry Franklin's boss when Franklin leaked those documents to Rosen and Wiseman of APAC. For that, he was forced to leave the National Security Council. Fife was also investigated by the Senate Intelligence Committee for sexing up intelligence that was used to justify invading Iraq. Edward Lutwick, member of the National Security Study Group of the Department of Defense at the Pentagon, Lutwick is reportedly an Israeli citizen and has taught in Israel. He frequently writes for Israeli and pro-Israeli newspapers and journals. Lutwick is an Israeli extremist whose main theme in many of his articles is the necessity of the U.S. waging war against Iraq and Iran. Henry Kissinger, one of the many Pentagon advisors, Kissinger sits on the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board under Pearl. Unfortunately, President Bush nominated Kissinger as chairman of the September 11th Investigating Commission. It's like picking a bank robber to investigate a fraud scandal. He later declined this job under enormous protests. Dov Zakheim. Dov Zakheim is an ordained rabbi and reportedly holds Israeli citizenship. Zakheim attended Jews College in London and became an ordained Orthodox Jewish rabbi in 1973. He was adjunct professor at New York's Jewish Yeshiva University. Zakheim is close to the Israeli lobby. Dov Zakheim is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations or CFR, and in 2000, a co-author of the project for the New American Century's position paper titled Rebuilding America's Defenses, advocating the necessity for a Pearl Harbor-like incident to mobilize the country into war with Israel's enemies, mostly Middle Eastern Muslim nations. He was appointed by Bush as Pentagon Comptroller from 4th May 2001 to 10th March 2004. At that time, he was unable to explain the disappearance of one trillion dollars. Actually, nearly three years earlier, Donald Rumsfeld announced on 10th September 2001 that an audit discovered 2.3 trillion dollars was also missing from the Pentagon books. That story, as mentioned, was buried under 9-11's rubble. The two sums disappeared under Zakheim's watch. Despite these suspicions, on 6th May 2004, Zakheim took a lucrative position at Bowes Allen Hamilton, one of the most prestigious strategy consulting firms in the world. One of its clients then was Blessed Relief, a charity said to be a front for Osama bin Laden. Bowes Allen and Hamilton then also worked closely with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is the research arm of the Department of Defense. Intelligence concerning Dove tells us that he is a dual Israeli-American citizen and has been tracking the halls of the U.S. government for 25 years, casting defense policy and influence on Presidents Reagan, Clinton, Bush Sr., 
and Bush Jr. Further intelligence points out that most of Israel's armaments were gotten thanks to him. Squads of U.S. F-16s and F-15s were classified as military surplus and sold to Israel at a fraction of their value. Kenneth Edelman, one of the many Pentagon advisors, Edelman also sits on the Pentagon's defense policy board under Pearl and is another extremist pro-Israel advisor who supported going to war against Iraq. Edelman frequently is a guest on Fox News and often expresses extremist and often ridiculous anti-Arab and anti-Muslim views. Through his ignorance, he actually called Arabs anti-Semitic on Fox News, dated 28 November 2001, when he could have looked it up in the dictionary to find out that Arabs, by definition, are Semitic people. They are Semites. Louis Scooter Libby, Vice President Dick Cheney's ex-chief of staff, as chief pro-Israel Jewish advisor to Cheney, it helps explain why Cheney is so gun-ho to invade Iran. Libby is longtime associate of Wolfowitz. Libby was also a lawyer for convicted felon and Israeli spy Mark Rich, whom Clinton pardoned in his last days as president. Libby was recently found guilty of lying to federal investigators in the Valerie Plame affair, in which Plame, a covert CIA agent, was exposed for political revenge by the Bush administration following her husband's revelations about the lies leading to the Iraq war. Robert Satloff, U.S. National Security Council advisor, Satloff was the executive director of the Israeli lobby's think tank, Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Many of the Israeli lobby's experts come from this front group, like Martin Indyke. Elliot Abrams, National Security Council advisor, he previously worked at Washington-based think tank Ethics and Public Policy Center. During the Reagan administration, Abrams was the Assistant Secretary of State, handling, for the most part, Latin American affairs. Played an important role in the Iran-Contra scandal, which involved illegally selling U.S. weapons to Iran to fight Iraq, and illegally funding the Contra rebels fighting to overthrow Nicaragua's Sandinista government. He also actively deceived three congressional committees about his involvement and thereby faced felony charges based on his testimony. Abrams pled guilty in 1991 to two misdemeanors and was sentenced to a year's probation and 100 hours of community service. A year later, former President Bush, Sr., granted Abrams a full pardon. He was one of the more hawkish pro-Israel Jews in the Reagan administration's State Department. Mark Grossman, Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. He was Director General of the Foreign Service and Director of Human Resources at the Department of State. Grossman is one of many of the pro-Israel Jewish officials from the Clinton administration that Bush has promoted to higher posts. Richard Haas, Director of Policy Planning at the State Department and Ambassador at Large. He is also Director of National Security Programs and Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR. He was one of the more hawkish pro-Israel Jews in the first Bush Senior Administration who sat on the National Security Council and who consistently advocated going to war against Iraq. Haas is also a member of the Defense Department's National Security Study Group at the Pentagon. Robert Zulick, U.S. Trade Representative, a cabinet-level position. He is also one of the more hawkish pro-Israel Jews in the Bush Jr. administration who advocated invading Iraq and occupying a portion of the country in order to set up a Vichy-style puppet government. He consistently advocates going to war against Iran. Ari Fleischer, ex-White House spokesman for the Bush Jr. administration. Prominent in the Jewish community, some reports state that he holds Israeli citizenship. Fleischer is closely connected to the extremist Jewish group called the Chabad Lubavitch Hasidics, who follow the Kabbalah and hold very extremist and insulting views on non-Jews. Fleischer was the co-president of Chabad's Capital Jewish Forum. He received the Young Leadership Award from the American Friends of Lubavitch in October 2000. 
2001. James Schlesinger, one of the many Pentagon advisors, Schlesinger also sits on the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board under Pearl and is another extremist pro-Israel advisor who supported going to war against Iraq. Schlesinger is also a commissioner of the Defense Department's National Security Study Group at the Pentagon. David Frum, White House speechwriter behind the Axis of Evil label, he lumped together all the lies and accusations against Iraq for Bush to justify the war. Joshua Bolton, White House Deputy Chief of Staff Bolton, was previously a banker, former legislative aide, and prominent in the Jewish community. John Bolton, a former UN representative and Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Bolton is also a senior advisor to President Bush. Prior to this position, Bolton was a senior vice president of the above-mentioned pro-Israel think tank, AEI. He recently, October 2002, accused Syria of having a nuclear program so that they can attack Syria after Iraq or Iran. He must have forgotten that Israel has several hundred nuclear warheads, some of which are thermonuclear weapons, according to recent intelligence from the United States Air Force. David Wormser, special assistant to John Bolton, the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security. Wormser also worked at the AEI with Pearl and Bolton. His wife, Merov Wormser, along with Colonel Yagal Karman, formerly of Israeli military intelligence, co-founded the Middle East Media Research Institute, or MIMRI a Washington-based Israeli outfit which distributes articles translated from Arabic newspapers portraying Arabs in a bad light. Elliot Cohen, member of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board under Pearl and is another extremist pro-Israel advisor. Like Edelman, he often expresses extremist and often ridiculous anti-Arab and anti-Muslim views. More recently, he wrote an opinion article in the Wall Street Journal openly admitting his hatred of Islam, claiming that Islam should be the enemy, not terrorism. Look, sometimes the word neoconservative is used when what they really would like to say is Jew. They being people who use that kind of language. And as a Jew, I find it offensive. There are two things that are um, despicable about it. The first is the imputation of dual loyalties. What they really would like to say is Jew. Mel Simbler, president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, a prominent Jewish Republican and former national finance chairman of the Republican National Committee. The Export-Import Bank facilitates trade relationships between U.S. businesses and foreign countries, specifically those with financial problems. Steve Goldsmith, senior advisor to the president and Bush's Jewish domestic policy advisor. He also served as liaison in the White House office of faith-based and community initiatives, White House OFBCI, within the executive office of the president. He was the former mayor of Indianapolis. He is also friends with Israeli Jerusalem Mayor Ehud Olmert and often visits Israel to coach mayors on privatization initiatives. A number of other dual Israeli citizens serving in our government are Adam Goldman, White House's special liaison to the Jewish community, Joseph Gildenhorn, Bush campaign's special liaison to the Jewish community. He was the D.C. finance chairman for the Bush campaign, as well as campaign coordinator and former ambassador to Switzerland. Christopher Gersten, principal deputy assistant secretary, administrator, Administration for Children and Families at HHS. Gersten was the former executive director of the Republican Jewish Coalition, husband of Labor Secretary. Mark Weinberger, Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Public Affairs. Samuel Bodman, Deputy Secretary of Commerce. He was the chairman and CEO of Cabot Corporation in Boston, Massachusetts. Bonnie Cohen, Under Secretary of State for Management. Ruth Davis, Director of Foreign Service Institute, who reports to the office of Undersecretary for Management. This office is responsible for training all Department of State staff, including ambassadors. Daniel Kurtzer, Ambassador to Israel. Cliff Sobel, Ambassador to the Netherlands. Stuart Bernstein, Ambassador to Denmark. Nancy Brinker, Ambassador to Hungary. Frank Levin, Ambassador to Singapore. Ron Weiser, Ambassador to Slovakia. Mel Sebler, Ambassador to Italy, mentioned earlier. Martin Silverstein, Ambassador to Uruguay. Lincoln Bloomfield, 
Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, Jay Lefkowitz, Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of the Domestic Policy Council, Ken Millman, White House Political Director, and Brad Blakeman, White House Director of Scheduling. Michael Chertoff is now the Director of Homeland Security. Prior to his appointment as Director, he oversaw the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice till July of 2001. He is the man behind the investigation of 9-11, or lack of investigation, as it were. Chertoff was the U.S. Prosecuting Attorney for the District of New Jersey. Michael Chertoff is the person who had control of the evidence and prosecution of the first bombing of the World Trade Center. Chertoff's father is a man by the name of Gershon Baruch Chertoff, who happens to be a Talmudic rabbi. Michael Chertoff's uncle, Mordecai, is also a rabbi. Michael's grandfather was a very well-known teacher of the Talmud in New York City. Chertoff's sister was the head of Hadassah, the women's branch of the Zionist Organization of America. She went to a Hebrew university before Israel was even a state. The Chertoff family was one of the founding families of the state of Israel. Michael Chertoff's aunt works with the Zionist movement in London, Chicago, and New York City. Chertoff's power over domestic security is enormous at this point. He is the head boss of departments like the TSA, or Transportation Security Administration, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, U.S. Immigration, U.S. Secret Service, FEMA, and the corresponding detention camps ran by FEMA. U.S. Coast Guard, Federal Law Enforcement Training Centers, Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, National Cyber Security Center, to name a few. Chertoff has direct access to the Department of Justice and the FBI because he has many Jewish cohorts in strategic positions throughout these departments. It has been a guarded secret for quite some time that Michael Chertoff was the author of the Patriot Act a bill edited by Viet Din that effectively nullifies the Constitution of the United States of America and the Bill of Rights. It was originally common knowledge that Ashcroft was the author of the so-called Patriot Act, but it was Chertoff who engineered this traitorous bill. It should also be noted that Chertoff has direct access to every single police and sheriff department in the country because since the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, they have appointed people in every police department to have a liaison for the DHS. This dual citizen of Israel, with obvious loyalties not to the United States, will be in direct control of events as they happen if martial law is ever declared on America. The appointed federal judges Alvin K. Hellerstein and Michael B. Mukasey and the former Assistant Attorney General Michael Chertoff, who now heads Homeland Security, have worked for almost seven years to hide critical evidence and block discovery of important details concerning the orchestrators of the 9-11 attack. Immediately after the horrific events of 9-11, while the country was mourning, grieving, and beginning to feel vengeful toward the supposedly official culprits, the key players involved in 9-11 were maneuvering in unison behind the scenes to cover all angles of investigation and began building up their damage control infrastructure. The Kenneth Feinberg Group, is listed as one of the top ten supporters of the Jerusalem Institute for Israel Studies for 2004 and 2005. The Jerusalem Institute is an Israel-based Zionist organization that supports the building of the illegal separation wall across Palestine for example. The Feinberg Group also lists as its clients major insurance and reinsurance companies such as Lloyd's of London. These are the companies who stood to lose billions of dollars if 9-11 victims lawsuits had gone forward. Feinberg was appointed special master by then Attorney General John Ascroft. Ascroft, 
a dedicated supporter of the Jewish criminal mafia and supporter of such groups as Stand for Israel, is today working as a lobbyist for Israel Aerospace Industries, or IAI, Israel's major military aerospace company, which hired the former U.S. Attorney General to help secure the U.S. government's approval to sell an Israeli weapons system to the South Korean Air Force. Kenneth Feinberg set up the Victims' Compensation Fund. This was a treasure chest of some $7 billion in taxpayer money that would be forked out to the victims of the Israeli 9-11 attack. Since undoubtedly many families lost their primary breadwinner on 9-11, they had a choice between a sizable payout or a long, drawn-out investigation with little to no guarantee of success if they chose to pursue legal action against the airlines and the passenger screening security companies. Thus, 97% of eligible victims' families waive their rights to litigate against the government, the airlines, and the security companies responsible for passenger screening at the airports. This prevented any discoveries that could be made via legal battle in the courts for nearly every relative of a victim of 9-11. However, our so-called Israeli allies, who masterminded 9-11, weren't satisfied with a 97% cover-up. Enter two very dedicated criminal Jews with close ties to the Israeli crime network and judges who very conveniently belong to the same synagogue. Judge Alvin Hellerstein and our new Attorney General, Michael McKenzie. A little background on Hellerstein is necessary here. Judge Hellerstein has a deep and long-standing connection to the Jewish criminal network and close family ties to the state of Israel. Judge Hellerstein's wife is a former senior vice president and current treasurer of a New York-based Jewish organization called AMIT. AMIT promotes Jewish immigration to Israel and stands for Americans for Israel and Torah. AMIT's motto is Building Israel, One Child at a Time. Judge Hellerstein, age 73, is also a longtime member of the Jewish Center of New York and a former president of the Board of Jewish Education of Greater New York. This raises the obvious question about why, in the 9-11 terror case in which an Israeli security company is a key defendant and in which individuals from Israeli military intelligence are suspected of being involved, was Hellerstein chosen to preside over all 9-11 victim lawsuits? And who chose him? Judge Alvin Hellerstein has stated, quote, There is an extraordinary public benefit in having these cases resolved and not allowing through them the wounds of 9-11 suffered by our entire society to keep festering. Hellerstein's mission was to quickly resolve the cases. The rush to case resolution was to eliminate all threats of legal investigations by means of more payouts. To this hour, not a single plaintiff's day in court to present evidence in a trial has come to fruition. The more persistent and uncooperative plaintiffs have dealt with the special mediator of Hellerstein's court, Sheila Birnbaum, another key Jew. Sheila Birnbaum, the special mediator, is a partner in the law firm of Skaden Arps, a leading corporate law firm with close business ties to Israel. The firm calls itself, quote, one of the leading U.S. legal advisors to Israeli companies doing business and raising capital outside of Israel. The firm's website proclaims, Many of our attorneys are thoroughly familiar with the legal structure, business environment, and political system of Israel, and several have been admitted to the bars of both Israel and New York, and are fluent in Hebrew and English." Unquote. Israeli individuals and companies, however, are suspects and defendants in the crimes of 9-11. At least 200 Israeli suspects were arrested in connection with 9-11. Certainly, these salient facts cannot be mere random coincidence. The key individuals who arranged the privatization and obtained control of the 10.6 million square foot complex known as the World Trade Center shortly before its destruction are Larry Silverstein, former Israeli commando and Westfield shopping mall tycoon Frank Lowy, 
and Port Authority Chairman Louis M. Eisenberg, who authorized the transfer of the leases. Silverstein, Lowy, and Eisenberg all hold senior positions in organizations such as the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL, the United Jewish Appeal, UJA, a billion-dollar Zionist charity organization, and the New York-based Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Jewish Holocaust. Silverstein is a former chairman of UJA. This organization raises hundreds of millions of dollars every year for a network of Jewish agencies in the United States and Israel. Eisenberg, who was instrumental in obtaining the lease for Silverstein, is on the planning board of the UJA. Eisenberg, in his role with the Port Authority, was the key person who negotiated the 99-year leases for Silverstein and Frank Lowy's Westfield America, who were, in fact, the low bidders for the lease on the 110-story towers and the retail mall. Six weeks before the World Trade Center towers were destroyed, the Port Authority, with the assistance of Jewish Chairman Eisenberg, completed the process of leasing them for 99 years to Larry Silverstein, the developer who had built seven World Trade Center, which mysteriously self-demolished at 5.25 p.m. on 9-11, although the building wasn't hit by a plane. Simultaneously, the retail space underneath the complex was leased to Westfield America, the U.S. division of an Australian company company that is one of the world's largest operators of shopping malls. Paul Goldberger wrote in The New Yorker, 20th May 2002. Czechoslovakian-born Israeli commando Frank Lowy, a former fighter in Israel's Golani Brigade, immigrated to Australia in the 1950s. Lowy leased the shopping concourse called the Mall at the World Trade Center, which comprised about 427,000 square feet of retail space. Today, Lowy and his three sons control Westfield Corporation, one of the largest operators of shopping centers in the United States and the world. Lowy is described by the Sydney Morning Herald as, quote, a self-made man with a strong interest in the Holocaust and Israeli politics. Dove Zakheim's SPC Corporation provided the flight termination system and command transmitter system. Some people have posited that the planes that flew into the towers were remote controlled. Although sounding like science fiction to the average person, this technology has existed for several decades. In an emergency situation in which pilot and co-pilot have been incapacitated, ground control can take control of a plane and fly it safe and sound to its destination. The argument for the use of this technology would be to say that to ensure that the planes met their targets, instead of relying on some supposed suicide hijackers, who might bail out at the last minute, remote control technology was used. We are not here to argue for this point, nor disagree with it, but it is more than telling that System Planning Corporation, or SPC, designs, manufactures, and distributes highly sophisticated technology that enables an operator to fly by remote control as many as eight different airborne vehicles at the same time from one position either on the ground or airborne. System Planning Corporation markets the technology to take over the controls of an airborne vehicle already in flight. For example, the flight termination system technology could hijack hijackers and bring the plane down safely. The flight termination system can be used in conjunction with the CTS technology that can control up to eight airborne vehicles simultaneously. The possibility of nefarious use of these brilliant technologies developed and deployed by Systems Planning Corporation certainly deserves careful consideration in any full and impartial investigation of what actually took place on 9-11. In the context of 9-11, it also needs to be pointed out that Rabbi Dov Zakheim was Chief Executive Officer of System Planning Corporation's International Division until President George W. Bush appointed him Undersecretary of Defense and Comptroller of the Pentagon. Not long before Rabbi Zakheim rose to power over the Pentagon's labyrinthine bottomless accounts, he co-authored an article entitled Rebuilding America's Defenses, 
Strategy, Forces, and Resources for a New Century, which was published by the Project for a New American Century in September 2000, exactly a year before 9-11. In this article, on page 51, it is stated that, quote, The process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor, unquote. Larry Silverstein, a key figure in the Jewish crime network, dual Israeli citizen and World Trade Center leaseholder, who pocketed $4 billion for the attacks of 9-11. Somehow, Silverstein had the mysterious foresight to insure both of the towers with an insurance policy specifically covering acts of terrorism just weeks before September 11, 2001. But things get more absurd than this. Enter p -Tech. The Israeli Mossad also had their hands in the most sensitive computer networks in the U.S. government through a little-known firm called p -Tech. 9 11 was also a computer crime. America's security apparatus and infrastructure would have reacted to the hijacking, then scrambled fighter jets and would have eliminated the threats to thousands of Americans. Unfortunately, most of the critical computer systems were run by p -Tech. This left gaping holes in the communication networks and interoperability between the computer systems which would allow a hijacker to cause severe miscommunication and delay any reaction to the real-time hijacking. Keep in mind, there were drills going on of flights crashing into buildings on 9-11, as well as other drills, such as Operation Northern Vigilance, Operation Vigilant Guardian, Operation Northern Guardian, and Operation Vigilant Warrior. Joe Bergantino, a reporter for WBZ-TV's investigative team, was torn. He could risk breaking a story based on months of work investigating a software firm linked to terrorism or heed the government's demand to hold the story for national security reasons. In mid-June, Bergantino received a tip from a woman in New York who suspected that P-Tech, a computer software company in Quincy, Massachusetts, had ties to terrorists. P-Tech specialized in developing software that manages information contained in computer networks. Brigantino's investigation revealed that P-Tech's clients included many federal government agencies, including the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Naval Air Command, Congress, the Department of Energy, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, and the Internal Revenue Service, as well as NATO, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and moreover, the Secret Service, and even the White House. On the surface, it seemed p -Tech can be linked to Saudis and Arabs, as they are the frontmen financiers of p -Tech. This is not dissimilar to the pattern, as the deceptive alternative media has also linked the official story's antagonists as 19 hijackers from Saudi Arabia. However, this is another clever smokescreen. Recall our mention of the word Sayanim, which means a Jewish informant or helper. Michael Goff, a criminal Jew who comes from a long line of Banabarith Freemasons, left a very cushy job with the law firm of Cedar and Chandler to work for Arabs and run marketing for an unknown software company. Michael Goff was marketing manager at P-Tech Incorporated, a leading provider of business process modeling, design and development software. In this capacity, Michael managed various marketing programs and activities including public relations, direct mail, web development, collateral, trade shows, and seminars. Additionally, Michael worked closely with the P-Tech sales organization to perform competitive analysis as well as manage lead tracking and fulfillment activities. Goff also worked for an Israeli-run computer security company called Guardium. Guardium is a database security firm, clearly a Mossad operation working in a critical area, the same area that the two planes that hit the World Trade Center originated, Boston Logan Airport. The three firms that finance Guardium are all Israeli and all manned by Mossad agents. It should be noted that Mossad's headquarters is in Herzliya. It is clear that the three firms, Cedar Fund, Veritas Venture Partners, and Stage One are all Mossad funding outfits. 
so with p what we had was an American cyan, i.e. a Jewish agent who works with the Mossad when necessary, Michael S. Goff, who had Mossad agents feeding him information and directing him while he worked with his Lebanese Muslim partners in p -Tech. Now, why would a young American lawyer working with a good law firm in his hometown suddenly leave the practice of law and work with a dodgy startup software company owned and financed by a Lebanese and a Saudi. Goff's family is a well-respected and well-known family in Worcester, Massachusetts. After law school, he had it made at the law firm. Why the sudden career change? It is clear that Goff is one of several hundred thousand Sainim, and he was tapped by Mossad to do a quick career change for the good of the Jewish people and Israel, of course. Under Goff, p -Tech software loaded with trapdoors and Trojan horses was sold and loaded onto the most sensitive computer systems, which subsequently failed miserably, or performed well, depending on your view, on September 11, 2001. Goff's father and grandfather, Samuel, were accountants who belonged to Worcester's Commonwealth Lodge 600 of Banabarith. They were both 32nd degree Masons. But P-Tech wasn't the only software firm that was involved with the massive breakdown in communication on 9-11. Because the attacks involved systems used by the FAA, NORAD, and the U.S. Air Force, the conspirators would have needed super user access to the command and control centers of these three separate organizations. One such company is MITRE Corporation. Indara Singh, an IT consultant who previously worked on a Defense Advanced Research Project, or DARPA project, and who was employed by J.P. Morgan on 9-11 in risk management, pointed to MITRE's role at the FAA during the 9-11 Citizens Commission hearings in New York in September 2004. Quote, p -Tech was with the MITRE Corporation in the basement of the FAA for two years prior to 9-11, Singh said. Quote, their specific job is to look at interoperability issues the FAA had with NORAD and the Air Force in the case of an emergency. If anyone was in a position to know that the FAA, that there was a window of opportunity or to insert software or to change anything, it would have been p -Tech along with MITRE. Unquote. The MITRE Corporation is a major defense contracting organization headed by the former Director of Central Intelligence, or DCI, which was none other than Jew Dr. James Rodney Scheltzinger. Scheltzinger, who was reportedly made DCI at the request of Henry Kissinger in 1973, later served as Secretary of Defense. Scheltzinger, a former Director of Strategic Studies at the RAND Corporation, was described in a 1973 biography as a devout Lutheran. Although he was born in New York in 1929 to immigrant Jewish parents from Austria and Russia, Selsinger earned three degrees from Harvard University. Selsinger's father, an accountant, founded the accounting firm Selsinger & Haas and was a trustee and chairman of the budget of the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue. His father was also a member of the New York State Grand Lodge of Masons. On 17th, October 2001, Michelle Moad reported in the Mercury of Philadelphia that two men were caught by federal immigration authorities with detailed footage of the Sears Tower in Chicago, Illinois. The authorities described them as Middle Eastern men. Police arrived on the scene due to a call from Pizzeria Uno, a restaurant whose manager reported that the men had a tractor trailer and were dumping something described as a pile of furniture at the rear of the pizzeria. Of the two men, one identified himself as Moshe Almakayas, age 30. This person fled the scene, according to police. The manager of the restaurant reported to the officers that the vehicle read Moving Systems Incorporated and included a phone number. The Middle Eastern man, later identified as Ron Qatar, age 23, exited the vehicle and said that the operator, 30-year-old Moshiel Makayas, was across the street. He was spotted with a Jewish female, Eilat Reisler, age 23, across the street, but she soon began to walk in the opposite direction of El Makayas as soon as she was spotted by the police. When Reiser was apprehended, 
searched and questioned, she was found to have a German passport in her name and medication in another. Getting back to El Micaias, he stated that he didn't dump any furniture behind the restaurant and that he was on his way to a customer in New York. He was unable to provide either an address or phone number for the customer. When an arriving officer examined the vehicle, it was found to be in numerous violations and even not in safe working order and was subsequently put out of commission. The truck was, in fact, loaded to three-quarters capacity with household items, boxes, and furniture. Officer Gerald Swartz of the Whitpain Police Department found a video camera amongst the load. Plymouth Police Officer David McCann reviewed the tape and found that it had footage of Chicago but suspiciously had numerous zoom-in shots of the Sears Tower. The three suspects were eventually questioned by the FBI and detained by INS. The Israelis were eventually released, but coupled with the antics of the dancing Jews that were caught on 9-11 and their front company, Urban Moving Systems, and these suspicious characters and their supposed moving company, is it possible that the plane that went down in Pennsylvania was intended for the Sears Tower in Chicago before the aircraft made an abrupt change of course over the state of Ohio? Israeli Mossad terrorist operations extend to numerous countries. Here is just one example apart from 9-11 and others that we have briefly covered. As reported in La Voz de Altasan, Two men posing as press photographers, one of them a former Israeli colonel and Mossad agent, were arrested inside the Mexican Congress on October 10, 2001. Armed with 9mm pistols, 9 grenades, explosives, 3 detonators, and 58 bullets, but were released following intense pressure from the Israeli embassy. The report stated, we believe that the two Zionist terrorists were going to blow up the Mexican Congress. The second phase was to mobilize both the Mexican and U.S. press to blame Osama bin Laden. Most likely then Mexico would declare war on Afghanistan as well, commit troops, and all the oil it could spare to combat Islamic terrorism. As reported in La Voz de Alta San, Los Angeles, Alta California. In a mind-blowing development, La Voz de Altasan has learned that the Mexican Army General Rafael Marcial Mesedo de la Concha, who heads the Procadura General de la República, that's the Mexican Department of Justice, has released the retired Israeli Defense Force Colonel and presumed Mossad agent Salvador Gerexin Smeki, an Israeli illegal immigrant Sar Ben Sebi. After both had penetrated the security of the Mexican Congress and were in possession of guns, hand grenades, and explosives. This morning, La Voz de Altasan had a personal telephone interview with Mexican Congressional Press Secretary Licenciada Adriana Lopez and verified the arrest of two Israelis after they had entered through the highly secure front entrance of the Palacio Legislativo de San Larso. She stated to La Voz de Altasan that the two terrorists had taken advantage of the situation that had occurred about 1700 hours of Wednesday, October 10th, when a large contingent of sugar industry unionists were entering through the metal detectors. The two Israelis followed about 50 of the unionists to the office of the President of Mexican Congress, Beatriz Padres. The two Israelis were first pretending to be press photographers, but called attention to the sugar unionists because of their nervous and out of ordinary behavior. About 10 of the unionists confronted them and observed that they were carrying guns and what looked to them to be explosives. They held the two Israelis until official congressional security personnel took them into custody. The head of congressional security, Salvador Alarq, verified that the Israelis had in their possession nine grenades, sticks of dynamite, detonators, wiring, and two millimeter Glock automatics. Mexican Congressional Press Secretary Licenciada Ediana Lopez informed La Voz de Alta San in the telephone interview that Congressional Security then turned the terrorist Salvador Gerson Smeki, age 34, and Sara Ben Zebi, age 27, to 
la Procuradora General de la República, Mexican Department of Justice, which is headed by Mexican Army General Rafael Marcial Mesado de la Concha. Initial reports by the Procuradora General de la República, PGR, were that both Israelis worked for a private security agency and that they both had gun permits. It turned out that there was no connection to either suspect to any private security agency. The PGR has released the retired Israeli IDF colonel with the official explanation that he had a legal permit to carry a gun. They also released the illegal Israeli immigrant on about $4,000 bail and had the case turned over to the Mexican immigration authorities. Mexican Congressional Press Secretary Licenciada Adriana Lopez was surprised to hear from La Voz de Altasan of the release of the two Israelis. La Voz de Altasan has also learned that the Israeli embassy used heavy-handed measures to have the two Israelis released. Very high-level emergency meetings took place between Mexican Secretary of Foreign Relations Jorge Gutman, General Mesado de la Concha, and a top Ariel Sharon envoy who flew to Mexico City especially for that purpose. Elias Love of the Israeli Embassy worked night and day and their official spokeswoman, Hilla Engelhart, went into high gear after many hours of complete silence. What went on during those high-level meetings, no one knows, but many in Mexico are in disbelief at their release. Guns and any kind of explosive is highly illegal for Mexican citizens. And the fact that these two Israelis had them inside the Mexican Congress makes their release highly suspect. What is really going on? Jorge Gutman, the Mexican Foreign Secretary, has very strong Zionist connections and himself is of the Jewish descent. Mexican Army General Mesado de la Concha has strong connections to the U.S. military industrial complex and through this to the Israeli Defense Forces. Have any of these connections influenced the decisions to release the two Zionists? Former Italian President Francisco Casega, who revealed the existence of Operation Gladio, told Italy's oldest and most widely read newspaper that the 9-11 terrorist attacks were run by the Mossad, and that this was common knowledge among global intelligence agencies. In what translates awkwardly into English, Casega told the newspaper Corriere della Sera, all the intelligence services of America and Europe know well that the disastrous attack has been planned and realized from the Mossad with the aid of the Zionist world in order to put into accusation the Arabic countries and in order to induce the Western powers to take part in Iraq and Afghanistan, unquote. The script for Missing Links was originally over five hours. Due to time constraints, many key individuals with established connections to 9-11 could not be examined. Here are a few ancillary pieces of evidence and information which you may research in greater detail on your own. It is possible that these will be exhaustively addressed in another film by the makers of Missing Links or by other investigators in the future. We encourage you to do your due diligence in investigation. Jack Abramoff. He entertained the supposed lead hijacker Muhammad Atta aboard his yacht. Keep in mind that the argument of this video is that personalities such as Atta were only used as misdirection. Such villains like Osama bin Laden are mere inventions of the Jewish crime network and are thus hardly worth mention, save for their direct connection to the Jews who planned, orchestrated, and benefited from 9-11. Iser Harrell, a Polish Khazar Jew who founded Israel's Mossad. He ran Mossad from 1947 to 1963. He was director of Shin Bet from 1948 to 1952 and Hagenau. In his career as a Jewish terrorist, he was also intimately involved in the JFK assassination. As a side note, the film which unashamedly shows the assassination of President John F. Kennedy was filmed by Abraham Zapruder. Zapruder is a Jew. 
The Zapruder film serves as a warning to anyone who would attempt to take on the Jewish mafia. It was absolutely no coincidence that a Jew happened to catch the assassination on video camera. But the topic of the Jewish hand in the JFK assassination is the subject for another film. Getting back to Iser Harrell, it is extremely important to mention that Harrell predicted in 1979 that the, quote, tallest building in New York City, unquote, would be hit by, quote, unquote, terrorists because it was a phallic symbol. The fact that 9-11 was planned by the Jews through the admittance of Iser Harrell is documented in a book by Michael Evans. Evans is a Jewish Khazar masquerading as a Christian. This is referred to as a crypto-Jew. Benjamin Netanyahu, when asked on 9-11 what the September 11th attack meant for U.S.-Israeli relations, Netanyahu plainly stated, it's very good. He also wrote a book in the early 80s titled, Terrorism, How the West Can Win. He was the Prime Minister of Israel to whom the Clean Break Document, or ACB doc, was presented. Benjamin Chertoff. Benjamin is Michael Chertoff's cousin. This Jewish criminal personality is responsible for writing a hit piece debunking so-called 9-11 conspiracy theories. Benjamin wrote the article for Popular Mechanics. Ever wonder why even the most well-known 9-11 conspiracy movies never bothered to mention the Jewish crime network? We gently suggest that it's time to start questioning not only those who attempt to debunk 9-11 conspiracy theories, but also question the very people who put forth such theories, with nary a mention of the exhaustive facts we have detailed herein that have been readily available to any investigator. Ronald Lauder, a key cyan, or Jewish criminal asset, cosmetics Estee Lauder magnate, he founded a school for the Mossad in Herzliya called the Lauder School for Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy. Ronald Lauder is also president of the Jewish National Fund and former chairman of New York government Governor George Pataki's Commission on Privatization. He is the key individual who pushed the privatization of the World Trade Center and the former Stewart Air Force Base, where the flight paths of the two planes that hit the Twin Towers oddly converged. Ronald Lauder played a significant, albeit unreported, role in the preparation for 9-11. Amit Yorin, founder and director of Guardian, he went to West Point and became the manager of computer network security for the Pentagon and Secretary of Defense. Yorin went on to serve as the czar of cybersecurity for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, which is run by criminal Jew Michael Chertoff. Stephen Kaufman, program leader for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, cover-up of World Trade Center 7 crimes. Even after seven years, NIST releases a report reaffirming the official fairy tale about the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7. Kroll Associates. Kroll Associates was responsible for revamping security at the World Trade Center after the 1993 terrorist bomb. Douglas France of the New York Times reported in 1994. This is a crucial point because those who controlled security at the World Trade Center are prime suspects in the demolition of the Twin Towers. The first plane struck directly into the computer room of Marsh or Kroll USA in the North Tower or rather it was precision guided on 9-11. Israeli Aerospace Industries, prime suspect for leasing possible flight termination systems, FTS technology equipped airplanes to the airlines. IAI is ran by Shalom Yorin, Jerome Hauer, John O'Neill, the former chief of counterterrorism with the FBI, who had investigated Al-Qaeda, was the head of security for the World Trade Center complex and was reportedly killed on his first day of work on 9-11. O'Neill had been appointed to this position by the managing director of the Kroll Security Company, Jerome M. Hauer. Kroll evidently continued to manage security for the World Trade Center complex from 1993 until 9-11. Prior to joining Kroll, Power, a Jew, had been the director of Mayor Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management, or OEM, where he had been the driving force to have the OEM command bunker built into Larry Silverstein's 47-story World Trade Center Building 7, the tower which fell into its footprint at 5.21 p.m. on 9-11. Testimony from Larry Silverstein and physical evidence strongly suggest that World Trade Center Building Seven was demolished with explosives, specifically using a substance known as thermite.
Where were our intelligence agencies before, on, and after 9-11? While there have been numerous analysts, operatives, and employees of the various U.S. investigative and espionage organizations who have come forward, it remains to be seen that the FBI, CIA, or other such groups have thwarted the Jewish criminal network. We must first understand who controls these organizations to understand their lack of commitment to America. Given the FBI and CIA's repeated ineptness and closing down of investigations into the Jewish crime network, it should be pretty clear who controls those two branches of our government. But what about the National Security Agency? On 4th November 1952, Harry Solomon Truman, the 33rd President of the United States, formed the National Security Agency, or NSA. Yet the operational objective of the NSA is to secure and protect the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The NSA may break any law so long as their actions return to that single objective. Hey, action! When it comes to secretive organizations such as the NSA, one can never be too sure what their objectives are. And if the total organization, or part of it, are controlled by anti-American elements. As outsiders, we can observe exterior evidence and hopefully reach some solid conclusions. On 16th June 2006, Christopher Boleyn, a reporter for the American Free Press, reported that the NSA has selected, as their encryption software, a program developed by RSA Security Encryption Software. RSA stands for the names of the founders of the firm, Ronald L. Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard M. Edelman. Adi Shamir, the lead theoretician, is an Israeli citizen and a professor at the Wiseman Institute, a scientific institution tied to the Israeli defense establishment. On 3rd August 2006, as reported at Salon.com by Sidney Blumenthal, the NSA was apparently sharing signal intelligence to Israel to monitor whether Syria and Iran were supplying new armaments to Hezbollah as it was firing hundreds of missiles into northern Israel. On 2nd February 2007, the ACLU added a video to their YouTube account which shows American Civil Liberties Union members attacking the NSA for domestic spying. ACLU is, of course, a Jewish-controlled organization. And of note, ACLU members in the video are Jewish. Americans have no assurance today and they will have no assurance tomorrow without an injunction that their phone calls and emails are safe from the prying eyes of the NSA. On 30th October 2007, as reported by Wayne Madsen, who was formerly employed by the NSA, the organization is now threatened with possible infiltration by Israeli spies. Mr. Madsen notes, that the National Security Agency was penetrated by Israeli contractors working for Israel's Mossad organization. This was done via programs initiated by the Reagan administration which sought to involve Israel in NSA-related signals intelligence activities, Dindi and Pyrex. Madsen asserts that the NSA has always harbored skepticism about Israel, quoting him that due to, quote, the Israeli attack on the NSA signals intelligence ship, the USS Liberty, in 1967, it was an attack that is now considered by a majority of historians and intelligence experts to have been a deliberate attack aimed at blindsiding U.S. intelligence from war crimes being carried out by Israel in the Sinai Desert during the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, unquote. Some questions remain. Why was the NSA supplying intelligence to Israel? Why is the Jewish-controlled ACLU preaching against the NSA? Why is the NSA still doing business with Israel when it is known that the USS Liberty was an NSA ship and it was Israel that intentionally attacked and killed 34 Americans on board and wounded over 170 others? Finally, why is Israel trying to infiltrate the NSA if they already seem to have such a close and favorable relationship? Who are you guys? The intelligence world was a family. Think of us as the uncle that no one ever talks about.